Now, I don't often show pictures of myself, but I'm going to be showing pictures of the people who sent in questions. And so I thought, to be perfectly fair, that I would uh, show a picture of myself. Now, here's Julie Hine. Now, Julie Hine, there in Cedar Rapids, wants to know this. What exactly can you do with a giant wall uh, of toilet paper? No, that's actually not her question. She says, are there categories of business that will wither or ones that will thrive over the near term because of the swing of the pendulum? And uh, the answer, Julie, and I remember Julie very well. Now, let's qualify what she asks. She's been coming to the Academy for over a decade because of the swing of the pendulum. She didn't ask, are there businesses that are going to wither and others that thrive? The qualifier is because of the swing of the pendulum. And the answer is no. Uh-uh. The pendulum doesn't, doesn't actually influence success and failure of business categories. It is uh, lifestyle changes and technology that, that trigger products and services. Um, now, number two, Julie wants to know, how does the move toward collectivism, which is where we're headed in a we generation, affect your advice for advertising messages that work? Thank you, Julie, for asking this. It's a brilliant question. Number one, in a we generation, it's important that every business chooses something to support openly. Now, when I say support it openly, I mean get involved, get other people to get involved, try to make a difference. It doesn't matter what you support. Just choose something that you say, hey, I believe in this, and we're going to be good corporate citizens and try to make a difference. And then number two, in a we, you have to admit a downside to give your upside claims credibility. Remember. To, to say or be a little bit self-effacing, to, to show somebody a picture of yourself in the ridiculous pants, and since you're holding a bottle of wine, they wonder if you're drunk. I wasn't, by the way. Um, but a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. A little bit of, this is me at my silliest, and hey, I'm okay with that because I have no shame. Admitting the downside, letting people know what your shortcomings are causes them to have more confidence that you can do these other things you say you can do. But if you're always talking about how wonderful you are and how wonderful your station is and how everybody who buys advertising on your station gets this great result, you have no credibility. You only have credibility when you're willing to share a shortcoming or a failure. And then number three, in a we generation, you need to articulate what you leave out. Remember, you don't differentiate yourself by naming what you stand for and what you believe in and what's included. That's part of a good message, of course. But you differentiate yourself when you articulate what you exclude, what you leave out. I've mentioned it before. What does a digital camera leave out? The film. What does Netflix leave out? Trip to the video rental store. And over and over and over, anything that is revolutionary, significant, notable, noteworthy. Um, anything that's remarkable is because they have made it clear what's left out, what's not included, what isn't part of this package. Now keep that thought in mind. We're going to come back to it several times. Question number three, three from the lovely and talented Julie Hines. She says, social media, how has it impacted persuasion? How has social media impacted pers persuasion if you think there has been an effect? Well, first, let's look at all the different things that actually come under the category of social media. Yes, Yelp is social media, as is Wikipedia. You know, that is a group writing project where everybody in the world can log on and share their expertise. Now, social media has dramatically added to the glut of information available at our fingertips. We can sit down today and, and have access to pretty much the total information ever, all ever gathered in the history of the world. Now, this idea that a year ago we only gathered information from five sources before we made our decision to purchase online, now it's ten sources. One year later, what's up with that? Check this out. We've entered an age of rapid distraction due to information saturation. This is another thing we're going to come back to several times during today's presentation. Rabid distraction, information saturation. Now remember, IBM on their website says that the social media plus closed circuit uh, television plus all kinds of digital monitors of different you know, weather and every kind of stuff, big data is a thing right now in the, the goober world, the techie world, the nerd world. And um, what it really boils down to is looking for patterns in 
these st staggering piles of unsorted data. Not stuff that should be related, but stuff that should have no relationship to each other. Weather, weather patterns, traffic patterns, uh, social media comments, Twitter feeds, and you look for patterns through these super fast computers looking at just, just literally worlds of data. And here's what's crazy, are you ready? If you took, according to IBM, if you took all of um, the photographs, the uh, magazine stories, the newspaper stories, the paintings, the books, um, if you took all the information that had ever been created in the history of the world and you digitized it, 90% of all the data we have today has been created in the past two years. That's right. All the data in the world today, 90% of it, has been created in the past two years. So you talk about information saturation. You talk about an absolute choking glut of stuff that we're confronted with constantly. Pow, 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 pow. You've heard me say many, many times the Yanklovich study in 2008 that said in 1978 we were stunned to learn that we were exposed to approximately 2,000 different messages per day. Well, now it's 5,000 per day. In 78, 2000, 2008, 5,000 a day. We have to fight that. And one of the things we have to do, and a bunch of you out there are in radio, get a load of this. A single voice can no longer carry a 30 second radio ad. If you're trying, if you're still believing that one person droning on can carry an ad, just a one voice and maybe some music for 30 or 60 seconds, sorry. We have become trained as a, as a society to just deal with just nonstop high volume, fast paced things coming at us, whether it's video games or the pace of movie or online video editing or even television editing. Get a TV show or a movie that's eight or 10 years old. Turn off the sound, put the DVD in and just count the number of cuts, whether it's, you know, zoom in, pull back, different angle of the same scene or scene changes, just any kind of a cut in say a two or three minute section of the, of the movie, just random movie, eight or 10 years old any type of movie. And they get another movie that's made more currently, any type of movie, and count the, same, the number of cuts in the same window of time. And you're gonna find unbelievable acceleration of pace of information coming at us from lots of different directions. We have to get in step with that in advertising because we're losing people's attention. Now, take, take a look at this. Uh, my partner, the great Paul Boomer, sent me this the other day. And this happens in 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, there are 695,000 Facebook status updates every 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, 168 million emails are sent every 60 seconds. 60 new blogs are created every 60 seconds. Brand new blogs, not just updates. Every second, 24 hours a day, a new blog is created. Who's reading all this stuff? 70, more than, more than one per second, 70 new domains are registered in 60 seconds. And so 600 new videos are uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's 10 per second new videos being uploaded to YouTube. And you just look around, 11,000 new iPhone or iPhone applications are downloaded in 60 seconds in one minute. 11,000 iPhone applications are downloaded. You sit here and go, oh my gosh, the amount of data that is being transferred worldwide. And this is why we have people that are having conversations, listening to the radio, watching TV, responding to a text, and doing their homework simultaneously. And they think that they're multitasking. In fact, they're being very inefficient. Now, Julie asks a number question number four. She says, does the swing toward we affect how we will consume? Brilliant question. And the answer is yes. Most people, certainly not everyone, will consume, number one, less conspicuously, and two, with a conscience. Now, that doesn't mean that we necessarily don't do selfish things. We just feel guilty about it. And it doesn't mean that no one does conspicuous consumption. There are still some, you know, insecure little weasels out there that need to, you know, flaunt it because they have it. Uh, but as a general trend in our society, we are a little less conspicuous in our um, 
display of whatever it is we think we have a surplus of.